All right, why don't we get started? So I'd like to welcome everyone to this event. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Philip Benoit, and I am an adjunct senior research scholar here at the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University, leading the center's work on energy for development. Tonight, we are kicking off our latest speaker series, Energy for Development. I will introduce our distinguished panelists a little later. But let me first quickly say that this event, like all those at the center, is being webcast live, and both the full video and a podcast recording will be available on our website and iTunes in the coming days. And that's why I had to read those words very carefully. And for those of you watching online, as well as people here in the audience, you can ask a question of the panelists at any time using the hashtag CGEP events and our Twitter handle at Columbia U Energy. Now, today's event is about connections, connections between energy development and security issues. Again, for those watching online and listening to the podcast, my name is Philip Benoit, and we'll have a test afterwards to see if you remember my name. And what I would like to do now is to introduce our distinguished panelists. First, we have Serge Mikhailov, who has enjoyed an impressive and extensive career as an international development expert. He has held several senior positions in international and French development agencies. For example, he was the number two person at the French aid agency, l'Agence de Développement. Serge previously worked at the World Bank as country director, specializing on the Sahel region, which we will be discussing today, as well as senior advisor to the president, the vice president responsible for Africa. He also served in the 1980s as a regional representative for the French aid agency in Africa. But his experience extends well beyond Africa. He worked for many, many years as a specialist on Afghanistan and on Cambodia, and he'll draw that experience into this presentation. In fact, he has recently published a book, which has just been released, called Afghanistan Development or Jihad. Our second panelist is Avril Haynes, who is currently a lecturer at the law school here at Columbia, as well as responsible for managing the Columbia World Projects. She is also a member of the National Commission on Military, National, and Public Service, and a senior fellow at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory, and I'll come back to that in just a second. But just to also let you know that there is life before Columbia, uh, Avril before was the Deputy National Security Advisor to President Obama, and was the Deputy Director of the Central Intelligence Agency. She has a bachelor's degree in physics, and then went on to become a lawyer. She also founded and ran a bookstore cafe for five years while engaged in community service in Baltimore. And so I'm very pleased to have Avril here with that wide experience to help participate in this discussion. Now, as I had mentioned, we are discussing today this presentation is about energy development, fragility, and international insecurity made in the Sahel. I will give a short presentation followed by a presentation from Serge and some comments from Avril. We will then have a conversation amongst the panelists before opening it up to questions from the audience and we will have a microphone available for you. For those watching online, you can, again, use the hashtag CGEP events and our Twitter handle at Columbia U Energy to ask a question. Now the theme of today's event is that everything is connected. When we think about energy for development, we often think about access or oil exports, or we think about climate change. But today we will look at the issue of security, and we will look at this in an international context. We live in an interconnected globe, and today we will be focusing in on the Sahel region within Africa. Now the Sahel region in Africa last year gained a certain amount of visibility in the United States because, as you may recall, there were four American soldiers who were killed in Niger near the Mali border. And arguably one of the reasons they were there was because several years before, 
and what you see that clock moving backwards is to indicate we're going earlier in time, there actually was a significant civil war in Mali. And in order to assist the Malian government, France sent in troops. But what was interesting at the time was that the French troops were supported as well by troops from Chad. Chad had been historically one of the poorest countries in the world and one of the poorest countries in Sahel. And it was interesting to see that they had developed this ability to project their military might beyond their borders. Now, arguably, one of the reasons that they were able to do that was because previously, and it turned out that there was oil in the Sahel, in Chad, in the southern part. And starting in about 2004, Chad was able to start to export oil, supported by ExxonMobil, which was the major foreign oil partner. And before that, 10 years before that, Exxon had actually approached the World Bank Group, saying that they were only willing to work in Chad and to build a pipeline across Cameroon if the World Bank Group participated to help mitigate some of the political risks. But for the World Bank Group, the objective was really of development, how to turn those oil revenues into not just money, but into poverty alleviation. And so we have this interesting situation where you have this group of Chadians, ExxonMobil, and the World Bank using energy to try to promote development but we see 15 years later having a big impact actually on security issues in the region. So I just wanted to present these uh, particular dimensions as a lead-in to a very interesting presentation by Serge. Serge? Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I want uh, first uh, to apologize because uh, this is the first time I'm making this presentation. I, I'm used to make a number of presentations, but uh, this one on the security, the link between security and, uh, and energy is really the first one I, I'm, I'm delivering. So I'm, you know, you need to, to be a bit, uh, a bit indulgent, as we say in French. Uh, so the title is very much, uh, you know, no peace and stability in the Sahel without electricity. And uh, the problem is that, you know, uh, Basically, I will. Uh, we, you have two parts in my presentation. One part is to describe the major challenges confronting uh, the Sahel. I, I would like to go very quite quite fast in, in this part. And the second part is really about uh, energy, electricity, and security in the Sahel. Now, if you look at this map of uh, of uh, Africa, you see that uh, insecurity has become a major major concern in three areas. Basically, the Horn of Africa, around Somalia, uh, northeast of Nigeria, you have all heard about uh, Boko Haram, and around Mali, uh, 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 very, very serious in insurgency, which is, uh, which is there. And uh, basically, uh, this has become a very serious event, a problem, since uh, basically the, the uh, 2012. So let's a, cl a very closer look at uh, the situation in northeast uh, of Nigeria. You see here the map of, uh, of Nigeria. And uh, when you look at the way the uh, jihadist the threat is developing this kind of fragile uh, country, it's very much like a cancer, you know? Because at the beginning, uh, Boko Haram was a very, very small uh, sect, which has proliferated because the northeast of Nigeria was uh, a, a region very much in, the, in disarray. And, uh, you know, these uh, uh, jihadist groups and uh, has been able to send terror, living out of uh, robbery and, and, and plunders all around, uh, all around Northeast, uh, and trying to establish a new order wherever, you know, there was no state to provide security and, and justice. If you look at the impact, we are still in the looking at the Northeast of, uh, of Nigeria here. If, when you look at the impact, uh, the impact is considerable because when you look at the uh, economy, the economy has uh, almost collapsed in northeast of Nigeria, even though the military threat uh, raised by Boko Haram is now much more limited. But uh, 
Basically, presently, about 4.5 million people face uh, hunger in north northeast of Nigeria. 2.4 million have been displaced. Uh, of course, some are now migrating to Europe and also in the US. And uh, when uh, you look at Afghanistan today, for very much the same reasons, about 45% uh, of the rural population in Afghanistan is also confronted to hunger. So that's one of the key, uh, key similarities between Afghanistan and, uh, and the Sahel, even though you have huge differences in terms of culture and also in terms of uh, human population history, etc. So uh, just a few, a few words about Afghanistan. You know, the U.S. has spent uh, more than a trillion U.S. dollars for 18 years to try to pacify the country. Uh, huge amounts had been uh, poured into Afghanistan. Uh, some years, uh, the amount of aid has reached uh, the uh, level of Afghan uh, GDP and the um, amount of uh, development, 50% of uh, uh, Afghan GDP. And the security is still so bad that the U.S. had uh, recently had to rush uh, back uh, troops to avoid a complete collapse of the government in the way, you know, the collapse which occurred in uh, South Vietnam in 1975. So if you look now at the three uh, countries of uh, the core of the French-speaking Sahel, Mali, here, you see where Mali is located in, uh, in Africa, in West Africa, Niger, you see here, and Burkina, the first thing is that if you uh, add uh, the, the areas of these three countries, it's about five and a half times the size of, French, of France, which means that uh, if you look at, uh, at, uh, at these areas, uh, basically uh, the five areas which were the core of the Sahel countries represent the size in terms of acreage of Western Europe. And uh, when you see these maps, which are produced by the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs, you have uh, huge red areas which uh, tend to progress toward the south. And these are clearly areas where foreigners are not welcome. Huh? If you travel in these areas, you take your risk, and a big risk. And even in the pink, uh, in the pink area, which are you know, located here, here, and here, and the capital cities are you know, included in the pink areas, you need to be very, very cautious. Huh? And uh, these maps remind me uh, the type of maps I was getting from the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but also from UNDP and other UN organizations in Afghanistan, where progressively the red you know, covers most of the country, and finally the red even covers Kabul. Uh, just to give you some ideas of the major challenges confronting the, uh, the Sahel, if you look at the uh, fertility uh, transition, which means basically the number of children per, uh, per woman in, in the Sahel, you see that uh, these uh, curves uh, represent the number of uh, children per woman over a 40, 50 year period. And you see that uh, Maghreb countries, I mean Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, Morocco, have, uh, have been able to implement what is called a demographic uh, tran transition, uh, reaching now a number of children per woman in the range of uh, two, two and a half. But uh, at the same time, the uh, Sahel countries have not even initiated this time of transition, which means that uh, even if uh, you know, family planning is introduced very you know, seriously in these countries today, it will take at least 30 years to, to have a major and significant impact. So in Afghanistan, the population has doubled since uh, 1990, but in the Sahel, population doubles every 20 years. So if you take uh, the case of Niger, I happened to work in Niger 35 years ago, a uh, population of 3 million. We already know that it will be between 42 and 45 million in 20 years' time, and in 32, 35 years' time, it will be si between 60 and 90 million. You may say that, okay, but it's a country two and a half times the size of France. The problem is that only 8% of the area can be cultivated. So this country will be confronted to major, major, uh, you know, uh, food and, uh, and, and, and survival uh, challenge. If you look at these Sahel countries, uh, which we are, you know, covering ba basically uh, a good part of the area in red and a small part of the area in, in, in yellow, I have some trouble yeah, 
here. You know, the problem if you combine the increased uh, population, uh, which translates into an increased density of the rural population, the systems, the agricultural system, cannot cope with this type of increase in population. And basically, uh, the soil fertility is destroyed because people can no longer use fallow, uh, fallow areas. Poverty is increasing. And of course, this is not a, a dead end situation because with proper investment and proper agricultural practice, you could improve the situation. Uh, the problem is that global warming will bring increased instability in this red area, which is already the area where you have a high rainfall instability. And global warming will not occur in 50 years time, only 100 years time, but it's already there and it will be, have a major impact in the next 20 years. So if you combine, you know, uh, uh, decreasing uh, yields, decreasing fertility, global warming, and increased population, you see that uh, we are heading towards a major uh, catastrophic uh, situation in these type of countries. Now, another similarity with uh, Afghanistan is that uh, you have a lot of illicit traffic. I don't want it to, to get into detail because it covers you know, cigarettes, hashish, surunka, etc. But if you look to the cocaine business, cocaine is not grown in Africa, it's grown in Latin America. But uh, the Latin American uh, cartels prefer to go to import uh, through uh, West Africa their cocaine to uh, provide it to the European market because it's much easier to have it, uh, to have it tra transported through uh, Algeria and Libya than to try to enter directly the, uh, the, Afri the uh, European market. So the, the fact that uh, uh, these traffics are developing uh, is uh, very uh, attractive for young people without uh, jobs. It's the same problem as in Afghanistan. And it, uh, it has become now a, a major issue. Now, so if Sahel were to collapse as uh, uh, presently Afghanistan is collapsing, and uh, this would be a major disaster for Afghanistan, first for demographic reasons. You know, in 2015, Nigeria will have about 380 and 4 to 400 million people. And if you take uh, Côte d'Ivoire's population, it has been multiplied by uh, 7 since independence. And if you apply this ratio of 7 to France, France would have today a bigger population than the, than the U.S with about maybe 100 million coming from, from Africa or other neighboring countries. So it would uh, have increased social tension and political tension considerably. I guess Le Pen would have been elected president uh, a long time ago. And migration were critical in, uh, in the uh, huge tensions that uh, occurred in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Côte d'Ivoire during the late 19th, uh, early 2000s which led to the loss, the loss of lives in the range of about 4,000 people. So clearly, West Africa is becoming a power cake. So you may feel that a foreign military intervention can pacify the child, but let's be serious. The French military operation covers basically an area the size of Western Europe with a population between 95 million to 100 million, which means about 200 million in 20 years' time. And France has 4,000 soldiers, so no way that France can be the gendarme or the region's policeman. What about the UN forces? They are supposed to intervene, you know, in these type of circumstances. But these type of forces can maintain peace, you know, as a kind of police force if you have a political settlement. If you don't have a political settlement, they are not organized to, to impose peace. Uh, basically, they look like an army, but they are not an army. They are not organized for, for that. And they sometimes uh, become almost irrelevant. And since in Mali they have lost about 160 men since uh, over the last uh, three years, their main concern is really to, to take care of their own security, uh, protect their own bases and their own, uh, their own uh, transport of uh, uh, their own transport. Now, what about uh, foreign aid? No, foreign aid can be a very important uh, tool. But the big issue is now that uh, donors are, you know, have understood that it's very important to, to be active in, uh, in this type of country. Uh, making good use of aid is a very, very difficult uh, challenge because donors are used and have been instructed in the past to focus on uh, well-governed countries. 
and uh, uh, in misgoverned countries, it's really a, 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 a big problem. Just to tell you an example, Mali has been able to absorb about 1 billion US dollars for 10 years between 2000 and 2012. Uh, and for a result where Mali basically, in Mali a few hundred jihadists and pickup trucks were able to overrun the country and they would have most likely taken over Bamako, the capital city, just as jihadists took uh, Mosul in uh, Iraq, if the French army had not intervened uh, massively. And this despite, uh, you know, uh, 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 aid to Afghanistan, which has been very, very important, uh, the results in Afghanistan, as we all know, have, have not been very convincing. Now, what, what about the, you know, the relationship between electricity and, uh, and, and, and security? First uh, issue is that what struck me has been th that in Afghanistan, despite you know, uh, years and years of uh, foreign aid and the foreign intervention in Afghanistan, uh, electricity has been uh, lacking for most of the country and even Kabul there was uh, almost no electricity until uh, 2012, 2013. Uh, the first reason is because a powerful larder had been appointed Minister of Energy. His name was Ismail Khan. He was supposed to, he was, he was taken out of the uh, crown of Erat where he was in control of the customs, basically, and not providing, uh, not uh, channeling back the custom resources to the central government. So the central government put him in charge of energy. But he had very much in mind to take out of the energy sector as much money as he could for his own, his own, own use. So basically, fear and corruption, the donors never invested in the energy sector. And everyone was uh, waiting for the completion of a high voltage line com coming from Uzbekistan that could provide very cheap energy to Afghanistan. But it was very difficult to, to build this line because it had to go through the or uh, over the uh, Hindu Kush. And basically, until its final completion, uh, one third of the Afghan population have access to electricity. And this was perceived by the local population as a major, fall, uh, major failure for the, uh, for the foreign intervention. And even most of Kabul at night was, uh, was remaining in the dark, which was quite impressive when you would land in the dark because you only see the lights of the, of the cars you know, uh, showing that you had, uh, you were just in front of a, uh, over, uh, over uh, a big city. And the fact that uh, electricity uh, is either unavailable or very unreliable, it is major constraint for the small and medium enterprises in Afghanistan, uh, because uh, they still need to purchase, you know, uh, generators, and to these generators provide a very a very costly electricity. And despite some pilot projects, you know, most of the countryside is, is in the dark. It's incredible when you fly at night over Afghanistan that you have absolutely no light be, be below. Uh, despite, you know, a uh, big potential in terms of uh, possibility of uh, implanting some uh, small hydro generators. So inside, just as in Afghanistan, the problem is, the critical problem is job because you have a huge underemployment. To give you some figures you know, extracted from the uh, demographic data, in Niger, 240,000 young men reach the job market, but there's no job because the bureaucracy is already uh, full and bolted. Second, there is no job in the industry because there's no industry, almost no industry in this country. The mining sector is uh, going down, going south, hence it is not recruiting any, anyone. So these 240,000 young men try to make a living out of uh, very poor agriculture or to make a living out of uh, uh, an urban uh, informal sector with uh, very low productivity and very low, uh, very low uh, salaries. In, sa in Afghanistan today, uh, the number of young men arriving on the job, job market is 400,000, you know. But in Niger, in 20 years, we can assess exactly how many young people will be accessing the job market, it's 570,000 young people. And the job situation is likely to be the same if there is no electricity and no capacity to pour. So will private investment be a solution? Let's be reasonable, you know. Private investors are not going to put their money in such uh, unstable countries. 
Uh, and at the same time, there is a huge uh, employment potential in agriculture and in uh, all upstream and downstream uh, uh, rural activity, but also in the informal uh, urban service and manufacturing sector. The problem is that, you know, what can you do without electricity? And lack of energy is really locking in the cell into a, a dramatic situation. And to give you some figures which are incredible, in Niger, only 9.5% of the population has access to electricity. And if you look at the rural areas, where 80% of the population live, uh, lives there, and insecurity is, has become a, a major problem, you know, the, number, the, rate, uh, the uh, rate of population which has electricity is 0.2%. So I, you know, I'm listening sometimes to big conferences where people explain to uh, to us that uh, IT technology and digital economy will save Africa. Okay, but first bring electricity. Huh? That needs to be very clear. And how can you expect keeping the young in uh, rural areas if there's no electricity? If they cannot, uh, you know, charge uh, their uh, telephone, if they cannot uh, listen to the radio, it's just impossible. And lack of electricity today locks the Sahel countryside into poverty because, you know, you cannot do anything, you cannot keep food, you cannot keep a medicine in such context. Uh, you cannot uh, expect the children to learn how to read and, and, and write in the dark. And how can you have a you know, local blacksmith repair a simple plow? He cannot, uh, how do you say, uh, Philippe, uh, Soudé? Uh, well, uh, you cannot weld a, a, a plow. Huh? It's, it's just impossible. So uh, how can develop also efficient small irrigation? Because it's so much more efficient to have uh, uh, electricity uh, driven irrigation than diesel irrigation. That you know, it's almost impossible to, to get irrigation. So should we expect the situation to soon improve? You know, I don't believe so, because in Niger presently, most of the energy is coming out of, uh, of, the, of, of, of the wood. Huh? And it leads to deforestation, desertification at a very large scale. And if you want to connect yourself to the grid, the average waiting period, I, I made a rough computation, is 115 days. Okay? But overall, the cost is about 65 times the annual average income. So forget about the poor. Huh? Basically, the only people with, uh, you know, significant income can have access if they live in the urban, in urban area, can have access to electricity. Even in Niamey, the capital city, only 40% of the population has electricity. And that's really too bad because uh, there is a huge uh, employment capacity in the small informal manufacturing sector. And if you combine, you know, microfinance, technical training, uh, if you improve the links between microfinance and, uh, and the banks, you can have a major impact on employment, uh, both rural and, and urban areas. But without electricity, what can, we do? what can you do? Huh? Nothing. So is it a matter of money? In fact, if you look at uh, the way donors have uh, acted in these, uh, in these countries, uh, millions of dollars have been spent, uh, but mostly to you know, basically build uh, huge dams or huge uh, uh, urban uh, generators, hydro and, and diesel power plants. Uh, since, the, since independence, it has been, you know, it, many, many projects have been implemented. But the key problem is, has been inadequate policies and inadequate uh, strategy, and a lack of understanding that uh, the standard approaches, which are uh, based upon you know, big grids to interconnect the whole country, are just you know, a, a, a dead end for these countries, and we'll never meet the rural needs. So wrong policies, first, you know, the electricity is produced by uh, large companies, which are parastatals, and these parastatals have a monopoly on transport and distribution of electricity. Uh, pro first problem is that you know, uh, trade un unions have generally uh, you know, occupied uh, these, um, these uh, parastatals, uh, uh, with a lot of demagogy. Uh, and the utilities are poorly managed, not because they are parastatals, but because they are parastatals, uh, basically the uh, government, the president, uh, put as head and, and, and in this type of parastatals, their political friends, who are not necessarily the best uh, people to manage such, uh, such uh, uh, institutions, 
And because equally, they have become, over time, the milch cows of the regime. And in addition to that, the government and uh, local state institutions, usually they don't pay their bills. They consider that uh, the Paris little will never have the, the, the strength, political authority to cut them up, so they don't pay their bills. So most of them are bankrupt, or at least short of cash. And of course, under donor and government pressure, they try to do the easiest part, which is to uh, expand the, uh, the large uh, standard uh, grid. Wrong policies, um, the fact that the parastatals have a monopoly in distribution uh, discourage completely private investors. Because you could imagine private investors in investing, for instance, in uh, small towns and beginning to uh, distribute and sell electricity. The problem is that uh, it makes perfect sense in uh, cities and densely populated areas. But the problem of uh, extending uh, 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 these, uh, these grids to the whole of the country, it's, an, it's totally an economic. And due to the uh, monopoly on energy in, uh, transport and distribution, the private companies have to sell their energy to the parastatal. And since the parastatal are broke, well, they don't pay the private investors. And you have no electricity, basically. Uh, because they are, they are supposed to be paid worth two to three years delay, or sometimes they are not paid at all. So it discourages completely private investors. Three wrong policies. Two block of uh, public uh, support. You have a very high cost of energy, and also you have very hazardous uh, installation. Here you see uh, people uh, you know, doing some work on the rooftop of, uh, of a building, but since they cannot rely upon the electric, public electricity, they have uh, a lot of small private uh, generators, and they are using these private generators for their own use. So the only domain of private sector involvement in energy is basically you know, to purchase uh, diesel generators and to uh, rent them to the parastatals, because the parastatals are short of cost to buy them. So it leads to very high, uh, very high cost. Or it's to provide uh, illicit and hazardous production and, and distribution. Right? And the cost of energy is in the range of 30, 35, sometimes 50 cents per kilowatt hour. So the key problem is that uh, with this type of approach, the rural cell will never benefit from I interconnected electricity. And this is areas where basically 70 to 80 percent of the population lives. Uh, it makes no sense to try to uh, invest in to interconnected system, which will be too expensive. And uh, uh, what is true also was that maintenance of uh, you know decentralized diesel generators is quite difficult. But now we have uh, solar energy, and the cost of solar energy has so diminished that uh, this makes this option a very, very uh, reliable and, and possible. But, you know, despite the existence of solar energy, these utilities, uh, which in the French-speaking countries are still EDEF, which is the French parasitical as a model, you know, they have neither expertise nor interest in this centralized system. They still reason in terms of highly centralized system with a big interconnection. But of course, uh, you know, interconnecting all, uh, all villages in, in a country such as India would require maybe 100 years or more. So the approach should be based upon village level mini grids, which are now well, uh, technically well, uh, well, uh, well, or well organized. And it, they use mostly solar or mixed diesel solar systems, sometimes at night uh, diesel systems, or individual systems. And the solar production costs now are perfectly competitive. For mini grids, it's in the range of six to eight US cents. 12 to 26 cents for individual solar uh, panels. But uh, the large utilities, they despise this type of decentralized system. Your mini grids are what? You know, they are banks of uh, batteries charged by uh, solar, uh, solar panels with occasional uh, diesel support if the batteries are insufficient to provide uh, electricity at night. They can operate independently of national grids, and the utilities see them as a kind of uh, unfair competition in a way. Since they are in a very shaky financial situation, they rather prefer to forget about that. 
And finally, when you look at the number of uh, pilot experiences, these uh, decentralized mini grid provide uh, better services than the major utilities, more reliable service and cheaper one. And even simple uh, rooftop uh, solar systems can, you know, provide uh, si si can provide power uh, to to freezers, to small machinery, to small irrigation pumps, and it can help create or develop existing businesses. So one of the major lessons is that donors need now to invest uh, heavily in decentralized rural electricity. But uh, the problem is that donors still very much impressed by the fact that uh, in many of these countries, you know, 60, 70 percent of the population has no access to electricity. They prefer to focus on large projects and uh, on dams and large power plants, and sometimes just to be, you know, in the in the new uh, new system, they invest in uh, in a solar system, but a centralized solar system, which uh, are not necessarily the most uh, suited to, to to be developed for a rural, basically rural countries, and they forget the high con interconnection cost and needs of rural population, and just to give you a, a, a general uh, statistic, 60 percent of this population has no access to electricity in West Africa. But it is so much easier to fund a dam or to fund a, a, a large power plant than to find uh, hundreds or sometimes thousands of mini grids. Huh? And even rooftop solar panels you know, allow people, uh, thanks to LED you know, bulbs, to have uh, and other uh, energy saving devices to have access to electricity, to have uh, electric light, to radio, to have uh, telephone, to have fans, etc. And now private companies are uh, ready to move into this uh, business and to offer, to install such systems and to, uh, so that the uh, people do not have to uh, invest themselves, but just would have to pay a, a regular uh, kind of rent and uh, they would charge customers on a monthly basis. So uh, we have examples where this has worked perfectly well, for instance in Morocco, uh, you know, 99% of the rural population uh, has now access to electricity. A lot of them thanks to interconnected uh, electricity, but in the r mountainous areas or in desertic areas, this is largely due to a uh, solar system uh, complemented by uh, some diesel generators. Now, uh, if you lo have a look at uh, Africa as a whole, 32% of Africans have no electricity. In 10 out of the 15, uh, where when uh, countries less than 20% of the rural population is electricity. And you know, 30, in 37 out of 48 African sub-Saharan African countries, the number of people without electricity has, has increased over the last uh, 10 years. So it's really time for Sahel to follow the Morocco example, because uh, you know, the problem is that um, uh, you know, we know thanks to uh, experiments, pilot projects, and recent changes in electricity laws in Africa that it is technically feasible and economically uh, uh, feasible also. But uh, uncoordinated projects uh, launched by, for instance, NGOs or uh, uh, different donors lead to a very messy, messy uh, situations where you have, you know, a different approaches, technical approaches, etc. And at the same time, you know, uh, you have a lot of impatience from the young people who have no job, no hope, uh, very upset about the lack of electricity, and uh, tempted by you know new uh, new 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 type of jobs in the uh, <laughs> in the jihadist groups and in the illicit traffics and de developing a shot. So just as in Afghanistan, electricity in uh, the Sahel countries is not no longer a matter of you know only bringing electricity to uh, better improve living conditions for people, but it's a key factor in keeping children in school, in creating jobs, in keeping young men in villages all the time. It's uh, has become a critical issue in maintaining uh, stability and security in, in rural areas. So thank you, and avoiding this type of uh, situation where you see uh, people crossing the Sahara on this incredible type Peter, of... Can I just wherever you from like. here? Okay. So, um, I think what I thought I'd do is just maybe um, go through what I perceive to be a reinforcing point, basically, 
to Serge's uh, terrific presentation. And an issue that uh, that I've thought something about and, and that I think is um, highlights many of the issues that have been described here is, for example, farmer herder violence that you see in West Africa and in the Sahel. And what's interesting about this is that unlike Boko Haram, we talk about with respect to violence in Nigeria and so on, this is uh, perceived in many respects as a kind of a local issue, but in fact has significant trans-border and international impact and requires in many respects, I think from at least my perspective and, and others' perspective, a kind of an international solution in some respects. In other words, at least a multilateral solution within the region. But it is an issue that is very significant and not focused on nearly as much as Boko Haram or some of the other things that we talk about. So for example, for farmer herder violence, if you, look at, um, if you look at it generally, you'll see an uptick in the last few years in West Africa and in the Sahel region. But in Nigeria alone, in the first half of this year, for example, I think there were about 1,300 deaths. It was about six times the number of deaths that Boko Haram causes in Nigeria. So you see how significant this issue is. And it's driven in many respects by some of the factors that have been talked about. One of them is obviously desertification, right, and drought, and much of it being uh, fueled by climate change, but also by other factors, including by the way in which energy is produced in Nigeria, right? So, you know, if you looked at some of the slides that were identified, if you're taking most of your fuel from biomass and waste and other things and you're chopping down your forests and you're doing things along those lines, that can lead to desertification and contribute to the problem, right? Which both creates an issue of constraints of resources that you then have conflict over in addition to the sort of land that you're able to, uh, you know, from an agricultural perspective actually use you see that get limited and that becomes a problem both from the farmer perspective and also from the herder perspective, creating a more acute problem. Another major driver in this issue is the population growth, also identified in the slides, right? So uh, Nigeria is in fact the most populous nation on the continent of Africa. And I think it's something, I think it's the 10th uh, in order of countries in terms of the highest birth rate that you see around the world. And this is a significant challenge for farmer and herder violence because basically as you see the population grow in these areas, you also see the demand for the land and for the resources that you're getting off of the land also grow, right? And so it becomes an even more acute issue. And then you also see the lack of opportunity for many of the young people in this country also contributing to this problem. And that's another place where energy has a potential role to play, which is just as was identified, I think, I absolutely agree with it that the greater access to energy that you have, the more potential you have essentially for seeing productive economic growth in those areas and in the rural communities of Nigeria. It's not nearly as bad as it is in Niger, but it's nevertheless, I think it's about 41% access to electricity in those areas, right? So you see a really significant portion of the population doesn't have access. So that is another issue. And then there are a lot of contributing factors, such as you know escalation in terms of the types of arms that are used in the violence. We've now seen RPGs being used in the violence between farmers and herders. You see uh, the sort of polarization and political abuse of effectively this type of violence. Variety of different issues that start to come into play with this. But it really also kind of demonstrates how energy can both be you know, part of the problem, if you're not careful, in terms of how it is that you're developing it and how you're thinking about these sort of fundamental drivers, but also can add to a solution set that you have on the table as a part of one of the most critical issues that you're dealing with. And Nigeria, I think it's, it's a, a very good example. I, um, President Obama used to say, uh, Nigeria is utterly critical to the continent, right? And you're not going to be able to see real progress in Africa, significant progress beyond, unless we get it right in Nigeria. And I think that is one of the key issues that we look across the board and when we're looking at these countries, we say Nigeria is, is a, a sort of a, um, leads in many respects across the continent in a variety of different ways. And unless we actually start to solve these problems there, we're not gonna be able to um, make progress, not just in Nigeria, but in other countries around the area. And as we look at the farmer herder violence, 
it's something that unlike, you know, people can have different projections about what it is that we're going to be able to do against uh, terrorism, you know, in the form of Boko Haram or others, right? But this is an issue where all of the trend factors, right, are going in the wrong direction. And it's just creating more and more problems. And we're going to see a continued uptick in the violence unless we actually address some of these fundamental factors that go into the drivers. So one of the things that people talk about in this area is that a lack of capacity of the institutions, essentially, that both deal with the kind of allocation of resources has contributed to the problem, but also a lack of capacity of security forces and others to actually address the challenge has been a big part of the problem. And if you see that as a sort of a vicious cycle where if you don't actually address the violence and tamp it down and restore order, so to speak, on some level, you also can create a kind of a vicious cycle where effectively the cost for engaging in the violence doesn't appear as high as it might otherwise be in the context of enforcement. And from many perspectives, the International Crisis Group and others have talked about this kind of vicious cycle being a contributing factor to the problem. And so again, you see how all of these things begin to create additional and integrated problems because if you're dealing with violence against Boko Haram and you're dealing with violence against farmers and herders, all of these things contribute to the same crisis that you're dealing with across this whole area. And as these, uh, with respect to farmers and herders, you see mobility of the herders spilling over into other areas, other countries, creating illicit arms trafficking, other things like that. So it doesn't get contained to a particular country in that scenario, it just aggravates the problem around the area. So all of those things, I think, are really reinforcing of all of the different points that were highlighted by Serge. And I think it's also just another way for you to see a connection between energy and development, essentially, and security, as was pointed out at the beginning, is how we should be perceiving these issues. So I think I'm going to stop there as an initial matter. And I know you have some questions, and we can pursue that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well. Oh, no, please don't. <laughs> Now, thank you to both of you for a fascinating uh, set of presentations. And just in listening to you talk, <laughs> both of you made me think about how very much big issues are driven by some very small things. I mean, in some ways, uh, I was almost thinking we could almost have flipped your presentation. You could have started with the solar panels and ended up at the security issue. And mm -hmm. so uh, I think that's a very important point. And also, uh, a real uh, cows versus crops, uh, it's a big issue. Uh, and a lot of that is driven by some small uh, decisions when it comes to energy in terms of biomass and the like. And I think another important point that you both made that I think cannot be overlooked, uh, in particular in this context, is the issue of young people. Uh, and whether we're looking at a situation where there are going to be opportunities versus frustration and what that represents as a, uh, a potential very uh, uh, volatile situation. What I would propose to do is I, I would ask uh, both of you a couple of questions and then we'll open it up to, to the floor for some additional questions. So the first thing that I'd like to ask is kind of going back at a macro level. Um, why should the U.S. actually care about what's happening in the Sahel? I can start if you like. Yeah, or I'll do the, yeah. I mean, I think it, it's a good question because it's, um, there's sort of different layers to it, at least in the way I think about it. I, there's a sort of a very parochial perspective that people can have about this, right? The sort of, um, you know, how much trade do we do with Nigeria, right? It's billions of dollars, in fact. I think it's about nine billion in terms of trade back and forth, but we export about, it's over four billion, essentially, to Nigeria. You can think of it from the perspective of, there are tens of thousands of American citizens in Nigeria, actually. Um, you can think about it from the perspective of foreign direct investment. I think it's about 4.9 billion, something along those lines. You know, so there's significant interest of uh, various pieces of the population. There are jobs that are fueled by the trade, all of those types of things. But really, I think there's a kind of a broader question, which is the one that was um, highlighted, I think, by President Obama in the, the sort of uh, loose quote that I provided, which is essentially that Nigeria, um, being the most populous nation within Africa, being a nation that's actually, you know, you're watching the economy growing, things along those lines, you sort of recognize just how critical it is to the stability of Africa. And if you see Nigeria 
disintegrate into significant violence and you see the economy start to tank and you see uh, the destabilizing impact of that and you see the destabilizing impact of all of the other factors that were de described, that ultimately will be a national security problem not just for the region but also for the rest of the world that has to deal with it as they're trying to manage these issues. And Counterterrorism in Boko Haram is a perfect example of the kinds of security threats that can evolve and grow in those types of fragile state, essentially, um, and potentially failed state scenarios. Yeah, maybe a, a few additional comments. I think it, we, we need to realize that uh, in the world, uh, the number of regions where uh, basically we can, uh, we can no longer travel has increased considerably over, over the last uh, 10 years. And it means that uh, in some cases, and that would be the case in, uh, in, in the Sahel, it's becoming the case in Sahel, we have regions the size basically of uh, Western Europe which, are, uh, low, which have become lawless areas and uh, where any type of uh, organization, uh, non-state organization, can develop, uh, sometimes with a specific ideology, sometimes only for, uh, you know, uh, mafia, business uh, type of, uh, of activities, and basically control areas which represent the size of, you know, three, four, five, six times of France. This is a major, uh, you know, uh, public bad. If we have public goods, we have also public bads. And I think, uh, you know, all those concerned by the uh, emergence of this type of situation need to be concerned, need to really uh, try to, to, to address it, uh, should share the cost, because these countries cannot pay for the security cost, that's another issue. And you know, we should all be concerned. And since the U.S. You know, plays, and I hope will play in the future, <laughs> a major role in terms of world stability, uh, it's important for the U.S. to be present in this type of, uh, type of situation. You know, the jihadist threat is still very active in, uh, in Afghanistan. It has uh, you know, been reduced in the Middle East, even though stability is not back in the Middle East. But a new front now is clearly developing in, in Africa. And as uh, Avery just said, you know, if uh, Mali uh, collapses, and it's uh, part of the uh, very serious hypothesis today because the state is actually collapsing in the center of, uh, of Mali. If Mali collapses, Niger will collapse and Burkina will collapse. And if Burkina will collapse, Côte d'Ivoire uh, which is very important in terms also of uh, stability of the old French-speaking uh, countries, uh, will run into a lot of troubles. And if, uh, you know, and the um, solution is not necessarily military. For instance, uh, uh, Boko Haram was a very serious military threat until 2015, beginning of 2016. Then, thanks to Chadian, uh, Nigerian, uh, a battery organized the Nigerian uh, troops and some Cameroonian troops with uh, U.S. logistics and uh, information systems. They, you know, Boko Haram was beaten in terms of military structure, was uh, destroyed in terms of military structure. But the problem is that the poverty issues, the tensions are still there. And uh, Boko Haram did not disintegrate. It just exploded into a thousand of small groups, which have created the type of insecurity that I explained in my uh, in, in, in my slide about you know these 4.5 million people facing hunger because farmers cannot now uh, farm because uh, their crops will be stolen. The markets uh, cannot take place because uh, you know they will be raided by. Uh, by, uh, you know, it's, it's not really jihadist, but, to, you know, this type of insecurity creates a lot of, uh, of, uh, of robbers, uh, high, highway robbers, in a way. So these are kind of problems that need to be addressed, because just as in a cancer, you can, uh, there's uh, a, a period when you can uh, act, you know, and after, if you let things develop too much, you know, it's too late. I'm afraid in Afghanistan it's too late, huh? Well, I mean, 
I guess one, one point that this, I think, highlights is uh, fragility creates insecurity, and insecurity leads to major economic problems that then creates fragility. And so we do need to figure out a way to break out of that vicious circle everywhere, including, including in Afghanistan. Obviously, a lot of it depends on what's happening in the countries themselves, and I'll come back to that in, in a second. But one question I'd sort of like to ask uh, as well is, is obviously the orientation of this particular presentation is on the issue of energy and the relationship of energy to development and to insecurity. But a lot of time when you listen, for example, to the press describe what's going on in Afghanistan, the challenges there or in other parts of the world, there is often not much discussion about energy. So I guess the question I have is uh, whether energy really is that important uh, to this issue of state fragility uh, and international, uh, domestic security and international security. Well, maybe a few comments in this regard. You know, the fact that uh, the foreign intervention in Afghanistan, which involved up to 150,000 troops, which cost uh, more than a trillion US dollars, was unable for 10 years to provide electricity to more than a third of the Afghan population. This has been perceived by the uh, Afghan population as a major failure. And it has been a major failure. Nobody wanted to invest in, uh, in a large power plant for, uh, for uh, Kabul because, uh, you know, everybody was expecting uh, cheap energy coming from Uzbekistan. And it took, you know, more than 10 years to, uh, to bring this energy from Uzbekistan. For 10 years, uh, Kabul was in the black. But in terms of uh, symbol, it was, uh, it was incredible. For the Afghans, you know, I discussed the matter with a number of Afghan people, it is incredible. The Americans have been here for 10 years, we have no electricity. How, how can it be? And it sent a message of a lack of, I don't know, a lack of concern for the day-to-day -day people, a lack of, you know, maybe lack of capacity. And then, you know, uh, electricity came in Kabul uh, in 2012, and then in 2014, for the winter, it was cut off, because a uh, pylon, big pylon on the Hindu Kush had fallen due to the heavy snow, and due to heavy snow, it was not possible to repair it for six months. And again, you know, Kabul was uh, without uh, electricity for, for six months. That's incredible. So the electricity in Kabul was coming from uh, individual generators, producing a lot of pollution. Kabul is in a valley like that. And then eating was, uh, most of people in Kabul were eating themselves by burning all the tiles. You know, you imagine the type of smoke which uh, so landing in, the, in Kabul by day, you could see the smog. It was really incredible. So this is what happens when uh, energy is taken as a kind of side issue. Uh, I think this issue has been much more forcefully addressed, particularly in rural areas, where the potential for small hydro generator is considerable because it's mountainous areas, and really uh, accept a few NGOs and a few uh, pilot project, very little has been done in this regard. Yeah, I, um, look, I think there's sort of, the way I think about it, there's, there are the scenarios where you see energy being critical from the perspective of power within foreign policy. And I think Chad, in some respects, you know, the example that was given is a very nice one, right? Then there's other places where you recognize that uh, energy can be a vulnerability for a country, where, in effect, other countries, because they're able and willing, for example, uh, to cut off the energy, or they're, they're supplying the energy, right, that they actually have leverage over another country and can exercise that in foreign policy. And that would be another scenario. I am, of course, thinking of Russia in some respects. But, um, but another, you know, the, the ones that we've obviously been focusing on is really in the context of development pieces. And, and I don't know if, I think both of you probably have more experience on this than I do, but one thing that, um, when I was uh, in working on national security as the deputy national security advisor, um, one of the things that we did during that period was set up essentially an interagency process to look at fragility of countries. And one of the reasons for that was because you would constantly be dealing with crises in different countries. Some issue would arise, a coup or other things, or you know, whatever it might be that's, that's happening around the world. And ideally, right, the country itself, like in the context of a terrorist 
actor, so on, is capable of dealing with the problem themselves, right? Is able to sort of manage their own resources and effectively handle things and deal with it. And it doesn't have to be, uh, by the way, you know, terrorism or violence of that sort, but it could be a health issue, it could be any number of issues, right? And what's clear in the moment in which you're trying to manage the crisis, right, is that countries that are further along the spectrum of being fragile, right, are less capable of being resilient in those moments and actually managing the crisis. And what's also clear is that when you're in the crisis, you really can't help them be more resilient, right? You, you sort of, that takes this kind of long-term investment and thinking and working on issues years in advance frequently, right, to increase their resilience, to help them become less fragile, to ultimately build up the institution and other things that you want to have them do. And, and so in many respects, um, recognizing where people are, you know, where countries are rather on the spectrum of fragility and thinking through what are the factors that are critical to actually helping them be less fragile is a fundamental issue to your broader national security and foreign policy. And one of the key factors in both measuring their fragility and also helping them is energy, right? It's a critical issue. It's not the only issue. It has to be integrated across the board. There's all sorts of other issues that, that deal with it, but it is really important. And I think one of the things that's just hard in this day and age, at least for me, is that, you know, um, it's very challenging, uh, you know, to think about even national security, qua national security. You have to also be thoughtful about economics. You have to also be thoughtful about climate change and environmental science and other things. You also have to be thoughtful about technology. I would put energy in that category as well. In other words, I think all of those are critical things that you need to integrate your thinking on across the board in order to actually solve some of the problems that you're facing. But Great. Well, food for thought. I mean, I think one thing that, that makes me uh, think about is often the issue of, of fragility is related to the issue of political legitimacy. Mm. Uh, and I think going back to the Kabul example and the like, the failure of government to deliver certain basic services, including electricity, in particular in contexts where you have utilities that are extremely corrupt, uh, tends to significantly undermine political legitimacy, and then and that clearly adds to fragility. Um, what I'd like to do now is to open it up to the audience. Um, anybody has a question? If I could just also ask you to introduce yourself, so maybe if we could start with you. And uh, Mike's going to come around. Thank you. My name is Christine Capiluto, and I'm a lecturer here at SIPA. And in that same vein, um, how do you make up for the lack of political will to implement the right policies? I mean, forget about uh, corruption and all of that. If you can't even get the leadership to think long term about how to implement these um, infrastructures and these right policies. How do you make up for that? That's very difficult, Correct. I assume. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe if we could have another one, perhaps right, we'll take two at a time, right behind there. And then. Hi, uh, John McWilliams. I'm a fellow at, uh, at, at the center as well. Um, there are a lot of difficult trade-offs here, and I'd be interested in having you discuss one of them. Uh, there's this vicious cycle where we're not going to have uh, development without energy. We're not going to have energy without investment. When you go to Africa and you talk to investors and companies investing in Africa, and you talk about the impediments and you ask them, they'll say it's the typical things, corruption, lack of rule of law, transparency of contract, et cetera. But one of the things they'll focus on immediately is the security situation. And so one of the difficult trade-offs here is at the same time you're trying to improve the security situation, money is going to security forces um, controlled by the state that have also in certain cases been uh, guilty or accused of human rights violations. And so I'd be interested in hearing you discuss sort of the difficult trade-offs that you face. Okay, great, thanks. Difficult uh, questions. <laughs> yeah, you put the finger just on a critical issue, both of you. Uh, a few words about the political uh, political will. You know, in most of these countries, fragility translates into uh, very inefficient public institutions. Uh, why so? Just because uh, in most of these countries, the purpose of a, of a, a state institution is not only to provide, let's say, electricity or to provide uh, any kind of services, 
but also to try to extract some rent out of the institution and to channel it towards a political group, a religious group, or any kind of specific group who has appointed this person at a specific position. So as long as uh, the society functions like that, it is very difficult to make meaningful, me meaningful changes. Because you can bring as much technical assistance, as much uh, you know, very good advices, very good advisors, uh, as much training as you, as you wish, things will not change uh, significantly. Change of the surface, but not significantly. So basically, the only chance to, to, to change the overall situation is to enter into a, a very uh, serious dialogue, political dialogue at a very high level with the heads of state and key, uh, key political players, so that they realize that they are uh, going into the wall if they continue business as usual. It may work with some uh, leaders, it may not work with other leaders. And I must say that uh, uh, in my experience, uh, the only way to try to get uh, serious attention from the leaders is uh, either if they have a major objective that they want to attain and to get this objective they need to, to change in a way the, the number of the rules, the informal rules, or uh, I would say fear. And fear is a major uh, you know, motor and a major engine in terms of development. You know, why has uh, South Korea made so much progress? Why Taiwan has made so much progress? Why Japan has made so much progress in the Meiji uh, era? Each time uh, they were fearing uh, foreign invasion or foreign control or, or neighbor uh, with a lot of problem, you know. Most uh, progress in France has been made after the major disaster of the war in 1870 against uh, Germany, you know. So in a way, you have some major events which uh, either provoke a change in leadership or sometimes even the same leadership begins to realize that they are going towards the war. I must say that uh, over the last uh, three years, I have made a number of missions for the Niger government. And uh, they were very clear, you know, these are very intelligent people, very clear people, and in terms of reference, very, very short. They told me and told us, we were a small group from our World Bank uh, uh, people, uh, we are going towards the wall, we know it, what should we do? Uh, so that was clearly a message that uh, 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 leaders, you know, from the president to the key ministers, that they under understood they were confronted to a major issue and they needed to react and even to, to, to change their way of, of behaving. And uh, of course, the list of reform that we suggested, they could not they would not be able to implement all that, but if they implement at least part of it, it will improve the situation. I don't think they will, it will solve the situation, but it will improve the situation. We may gain you know, 10, 15 years, and you know, nobody what knows what will happen in 10, 15 years. So in terms of uh, political will, this is how you can, you can react. You know. I can give one of my, uh, if it's not too long, one of my personal experience. We were working together at that time. Uh, uh, I know. We used to work together just for disclosure. Uh, <laughs> you know, when I was a country director of the World Bank, I was asked to, uh, by the president of Cameroon to bring Cameroon to the EPIC decision point, you know, where you can't sell the debt. And for that, you need to perform pretty well in a number of sectors. And uh, I had first a meeting with the, all the ambassadors in Cameroon, located in Cameroon, who told me, forget about that. The Cameroon is so mismanaged, that, and there's no political will to, uh, to fix any of the basic flaws, corruption, etc. You will never to be able to bring Cameroon to the EP decision point. So I was very embarrassed. And Cameroon had blown three successive IMF programs in three years. So, you know, it was clear that there was a lack of political will. But, uh, well, I went to see the president. I told him that I was, you know, eager to support his effort to bring Cameroon to the EPG decision point. But uh, there was no way for me to, uh, to do that uh, with the president, uh, uh, Tim, in charge of uh, uh, health, education, 
and, uh, and also the, the economy. And I could see on his face that he was very unhappy with what I was telling him. I think I was the first donor to speak to him very frankly like that. And he, he, you know, he helped me to, to the door. And I haven't heard for two months about the same issue, but there was a government reshuffle, and three very serious technocrats were appointed at these positions. You see, I should not... Uh, no, a security situation. Uh, you know, my belief, uh, having worked on those issues for uh, 12 years as a consultant, is that uh, uh, foreign forces will never bring uh, uh, long-term security into these type of countries because they are perceived as uh, very quickly as an occupation force. You know, in Kabul in 2002, I saw people in the street applauding a U.S. patrol, but three years later, people were spitting on the way uh, where, where, where the U.S. patrol uh, had, be, had been walking. And today, uh, French in Mali, uh, they were you know, cheered when they arrived in 2013, and they saved uh, Bamako from jihadist uh, uh, takeover. But uh, now, uh, from my discussion with my, uh, a number of friends in the French military, uh, each time they get out of the bases, they are pelted with stones. And you know, even in France, you know, I, you know, I'm very grateful to the U.S. because the U.S. liberated my country. I was a, a, a very small child at, at that time, but uh, so I am really grateful for the you know, U.S. citizen who uh, really uh, lost our, their lives by disembarking in Normandy and fighting through France. But in, uh, in, when I was 10 years old, uh, in uh, basically 1952-53, uh, 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 on the walls, you, you would see a huge inscription, U.S. Go Home. Uh, this was, of course, a, a group of people, a large group of people that had been manipulated by the Communist Party to, to make the U.S. a kind of... Uh, Book emissaire, how do you say that? Scapegoat. Scap scapegoat, yeah. uh, For everything which was not functioning well in France, and if you had an accident with a, a US truck, it was the fault of the US Army, etc., etc. But this is very much what happens in this country. And since the UN is not the solution, the only solution is to try to restructure, reform the uh, secur local security forces. Because most of them are in a very poor uh, situation, very poor condition, but the problem is that donors do not want to fund security because they, uh, you know, they say every, everywhere, just, uh, you know, uh, uh, an old uh, record uh, that uh, there's no security without development, no development without security. They don't want to fund security because it's dirty. But if they don't fund security, there's no way for Niger, for Mali, to fund its own security. And it's not by only providing technical assistance, a few tanks, etc., to the local security forces that you are going to improve in any way the situation. For five years, Mali has received security training, security support from France, from Germany, from the EU, from the US, and today it's the same situation. And the police in Afghanistan receive the same type of support from Germany, from France, from the US, etc and the police is still uh, a mafia. Why? Because the top was a mafia, and the top of the, the institution is still a mafia, or run by a mafia, mafiosi. Uh, better trained, better equipped, with computer, with better cars, but still mafia. So my concern is that Malian army is still the same mafia as it was uh, 10 years ago. Better equipped, uh, better guns, <laughs> some better instruments, you know. But so you need to clean up that. And to clean it up, you need political will, or you need a specific threat. If I were Macron, I'm working with his advisor, so I don't, you know, I would have a one-on-one -on -one discussion with the president of, uh, of Mali, who has just been re-elected. Listen, you have a number of uh, core state institutions to thoroughly reform. The army, the gendarmerie, the energy uh, ministry, the Agriculture Ministry, let's not be too ambitious. Five, six 
institution like that. Not the 50 uh, million size institution. But unless you really put at the top of this institution people with some charisma and some capacity to have things change, I'm sorry, but the French army will withdraw. And that's not a French problem, that's your problem. And I can tell you that uh, things will change. Because uh, if France withdraw like that, a coup will occur in Mali. And neighboring countries will be so upset that they will force a change to, uh, to Mali. So this is what, how things can change. But of course, you need to engage into very tough political discussions. Uh, I must say that uh, Macron is a bit young to be respected for that. But he's tough, <laughs> so nobody <laughs> knows how it will turn. Ariel? Um, sure. So I, I'll start with maybe uh, the last question and then come to the first uh, and just try to add to what's been said. On the human rights piece, I think this is something um, I've seen folks struggle with a fair amount, and I'll, I'll give you my perspective, obviously, on this issue. I, um, I think it's utterly critical, not just from a values perspective, but actually from a security perspective, to be thoughtful about the human rights piece when you are assisting other countries with their security. And it, one of the challenges you face, obviously, is that, you know, the farmers herders, violence, Boko Haram, others, you're seeing uh, civilians essentially um, experience violence and you recognize the importance of security forces actually being mobilized, whether they be police or you know, the forces uh, of a country to address the situation because obviously there's a human rights issue associated with the people who are trying to defend themselves from the violence and without those security forces, dealing with the situation, it only gets worse and you create this culture of impunity and that's critical to actually solving the problem. At the same time, if you're a country like the United States or France and you're providing assistance to these countries and their security forces, you frequently find that there are human rights challenges in the way they address the violence. And what I have found at least is that the most effective way of dealing with this is really having the people at the very highest level of government constantly focused on that issue, being vocal about that fact, and consistently pushing on whether or not we are monitoring it, whether or not we are seeing it, whether or not we are training for human rights issues and doing it. It is definitely not perfect. In other words, there is plenty of scenarios in which you see assistance go and you find out that something happened and that's a problem. But it also takes a certain amount of courage and uh, political will to get to the first question. Um, to actually say, we're not going to continue to provide assistance unless you fix this, or and to seriously mean it, or we need to see you do something different as a consequence of what we're seeing. And it really takes people at the highest levels, again, to be focused on that. And part of what you're doing is you're sending a message about human rights overall, right? So not just to that country and that place where it's happening, but rather a message across the board and how much you value these things. But from the security perspective, if a security force or police department is actually violating human rights in a significant way and addressing the violence, that also creates a backlash that adds to the security problem over the long term. And that's a significant issue from a national security perspective. And you need to actually be thoughtful and recognize that at the highest levels and have, you know, hopefully a president and others who are actually engaged on that and willing to put their time and effort in talking to people about it and raising it on a consistent basis and demonstrating the importance with which they perceive it. So I think it's a really good question and it's a very tough issue in the breach. In other words, it's very easy to talk about this in general terms, but when you're actually dealing with it, that's when you know rubber meets the road. So then on the political will issue, it's, it's also a really good question. As Sergio said, this is, these are the two heart of the question in many respects. I, um, I think only to add to what you said, because I think what you said was perfect in, in many respects and I agreed with it. It's just, it's very easy to say that the problem is a political will issue. It frequently is a political will issue. But um, what you don't want to do is just say, and therefore I give up, right? Because that can't be the right answer. And what you do generally, I found in my experience, is everything you possibly can to incentivize and to push people. And I think 
doing what you did was the perfect example in that scenario where it makes a difference and maybe it was surprising to people. I think you also think about incentives, whether it be, you know, in other words, we won't provide you assistance unless you do X, Y, and Z, right, and really sticking to it in certain circumstances. That's not always possible. It's also about just using every tool in your toolbox in a sense. And one of them that I'm particularly um, a fan of that is challenging but important in my view is uh, essentially monitoring and creating transparency about what's happening so that not only do governments have the ability and international organizations have the ability to hold a country accountable for what's occurring and a government and say this is not what you said you were going to do, this is a problem. But it also allows many of the grassroots organizations that are around to actually speak up and use that information in a way that creates pressure. That it's very hard sometimes to see when that's going to work, when the dam will break, but it's absolutely worth it in every circumstance. So I think um, keep hitting your head against the wall, basically. Occasionally, you actually make it through. So be it. All right. Yeah. No, thank you for that. Actually, I'll take a moderator's prerogative to sort of follow up on that, because I think in some ways, I, the political will issue is a critical issue. <laughs> uh, and it's a question of how do you create political will where it's not, where it doesn't exist, or have them act like there's political will. And in some sense, to follow up on these two points, for me, there's kind of a bottom top down and bottom up. And I'm glad I've really started talking about the bottom up. But on the top down, one thing I think that's important to recognize, in particular in the African context, is that there are many African countries who are doing very, very well and have had a lot of serious growth for a number of years. And what's happening with your neighbors is relevant. And so, for example, you focused on certain parts of the Sahel, but Senegal, for example, has done very, very well. And so what you're seeing now is this situation where you have a number of countries, Uganda, Tanzania, Senegal, that have had uh, Ghana extended growth for over a number of years, and that's going to start creating uh, an imbalance between those countries that aren't doing well and those countries that are doing well, and that's going to put, I think, in some ways, some additional pressure on the leaders. But I think coming back to uh, Avril's point, the fact of the matter is, and you see this in, in a lot of what development agencies are doing, they try to diversify the number of actors in there. They try to uh, empower more of the population by promoting accountability, by promoting the dissemination of information uh, and the like. Uh, and really just try to engender some, some greater people power. You see, even in the context of parastatals that we were talking about, state-owned enterprises, one of the advantages of breaking up a state-owned enterprise and allowing the private sector to come in is you're increasing the number of economic actors who are now start having an important role in the economy and then there's a certain political uh, power that, that comes with that. So I, I think uh, in some ways to summarize both it comes very much top down but very much there needs to be pressure uh, from the bottom. Uh, why don't we go to this side? Take two questions. Uh, there's a mic coming. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ryan Conlin and I'm an energy student at NYU. I found both of your points very interesting about uh, solar penetration in Mali being a huge opportunity to change the country and greater decentralization, as well as your point that uh, Nigeria is perceived as the key to changing the region. So I, I'm curious to hear your perspectives on how you see the challenges and opportunities of renewable energy penetration in a place like Nigeria or even Chad and Sudan that uh, are heavily focused on the oil industry with which comes with greater centralization. How you see that as an opportunity to change the region as well as, uh, I guess, uh, change the opportunity to grow and develop the economy as well. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nigori Semedinov. I'm a second year student here um, at SIPA. So um, it has been mentioned that job generation and unemployment are some of the drivers behind the insecurity, forcing the young men kind of to join the different, uh, well, for migration also, but also joining the terrorist organizations. Um, so my question is about specifically, I'm more, I'm more familiar with the Western Africa. So in uh, West Africa, what do you think? What is your view on the still very present and significant influence of France, um, economically speaking, uh, in the continent and in that area specifically? How does that stifle economic development and local job generation and unemployment, if it does at all? Thank you. <laughs> 
Mm -hmm. So I'll rephrase that. So, Salsha, if you could talk about the role of French imperialism and neo-imperialism in Western Africa. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but that's part of it. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure if I understood the question. The second. The second. The second. I think it's the same. Right? It's you're basically talking about what is. The, Uh, you know, I could speak for the whole night about <laughs> France and Africa and what it has done well and what it has not done well. But uh, it's, it's a complex uh, and complicated history. Uh, what worries me more is that uh, for the last uh, 20 years, Africans' heads of state, uh, particularly those of the CFA zone, have been major players in French politics because uh, the, the capacity to invest in specific politicians in France was uh, considerable when compared to the amount of uh, own resources of the different political parties. And you have had some, uh, even some uh, heads of states who have been distributing uh, big money to most uh, French uh, political parties. So you know, it, goes been, it goes both ways. Huh? You have a nice arrangement, a number of issues, Uh, regarding, you know, France uh, helping uh, some countries for this and this, or for obtaining a specific uh, support in, uh, in, in this and this area, for instance, in the UN, or in terms of uh, access to mining rights, even though now it's more China with uh, easy access to, to mining rights. But at the same time, uh, you have a lot of money which uh, has gone from uh, Africa to France, to fund specific political parties and to, to maintain this kind, of, uh, this kind of cozy relationship. Now, Macron's arrival has broken that. So that's one of the good <laughs> consequences of uh, Macron's arrival. And I don't think he will uh, resume any kind of this type of, uh, of approach. At the same time, he's, uh, he inherits of a uh, past in which uh, most uh, heads of state are uh, Have 30 years, uh, are 30 years older than he is, uh, where there is a lot of uh, interconnection, inter business interest, etc. So these things will change uh, progressively. At the same time, most French interest, economic interests in Africa are not in French speaking Africa. They are now in Nigeria, they are now in Kenya, they are now in South Africa, and uh, no longer in uh, Mali, etc. Right. Yeah, no, I think you did. Um, Avril? Sure. I, um, I'll focus, I guess, on the first question. <laughs> I, the, uh, um, I'm really hardly the expert on this, so take this with a grain of salt. But, uh, but two things, I guess. One is um, what I've learned suggests to me that uh, in Nigeria, one of the key challenges is that you have these utility companies that are trying to expand the grid in many respects, right? And uh, through a variety of capacity challenges that are associated with that. Um, what I've heard from energy experts who do look at this area is that they don't think that they're making very good decisions about where to grow the grid, essentially, which populations to push into and so on. And moreover, that uh, what is not being given enough consideration is um, other alternatives to growing the main grid, such as microgrids, other types of you know, solar panels and so on, that, um, that might be used in those scenarios and might be more effective for particular populations. And one of the challenges, as I understand it, to doing that, even if these utility companies basically were very effective, had the capacity to do it and so on, one of the challenges is that it's very hard to get uh, good information about what the demand is for electricity in a certain area, what the willingness to pay is for that electricity, where is the market going to be most viable, right? Which both helps you make decisions about where to grow the grid, where other solutions are viable and so on, but also helps you make a case to the private sector for investing, right? And, and I think that's something that, uh, you know, there's a, a project that we've been looking at that many of the people who are here 
uh, today have been considering that Vijay Modi and, and others, um, you know, have been thinking about, which is, can we aggregate data? Can we collect additional data? Can we think about these things, not per se in Nigeria, but in other places, to really start to model what does demand look like? What does future demand look like? How do you make decisions about where to grow a national grid? How do you do solar? All of those kinds of things, and that would expand it. So those are some of the factors that I think contribute to the challenge, essentially, in actually getting to what sometimes people refer to as last mile candidates for access to energy. But it is such an enormous challenge right now, and I think there's no question that people recognize the importance of expanding access to energy. But it's one of those things where, you know, it's not obviously just one issue, but that's, I'd say, a key piece, at least within Nigeria, and I do think it is critical. The only thing I'd flip with respect to your statement about Nigeria is key to progress in the region is just to say that it's, in a way, it's, um, the way I think about it is, if it fails, that will be a significant problem for progress in the region, right? Even if we get Nigeria right, like I think that can help to fuel progress in the region. I don't think it means that we definitely will have progress in the region. But, um, but I do see it as a key you know, country where if you can get it right here, you can demonstrate how it can be done and it has some of the more significant problems, but also some of the, the greatest opportunities for success when you look at the economy and others too. So. Great. Thanks, thanks for that. I also just want, when you talk about Nigeria, you've got to talk about political governance issues, so, and something you alluded yeah. to. Um, so uh, I'd like to thank you all for, for joining us. Um, as I mentioned, the full video recording of this event will be available on our website in a few days. You can also subscribe to our podcast series on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and lots of other platforms. Uh, this is one of a number of great events that we're hosting in the coming weeks. Uh, we also have an upcoming event on Energy Perspectives 2018 by uh, Equinor, the old Statoil, uh, which will take place on October 12th in Lerner Hall from 9.30 a.m. to 11 a.m. We'll have the Senior Vice President and Chief Economist at Equinor presenting. Uh, we also have another presentation about the future of petrochemicals by the IEA, uh, Peter Levy, the energy analyst at the IEA, and co-lead author of the upcoming IEA report on petrochemicals will be presenting. I'm sure many of you will be there. It's actually a surprisingly interesting and important uh, area. Uh, that'll be October 17th from 6 to 7.30 p.m. at the School of Journalism. Uh, and so we hope to see you all again soon at another CGEP event. And please join me in thanking our distinguished